007 Tomorrow Never Dies was released in 1999 for all three regions. It marked both the first Bond game to come out after GoldenEye 64, as well as the first Bond game to be made under EA since they had recently acquired the license. The game's developer, Black Ops Entertainment, worked on this project for more than three years. Founded in 1994, Black Ops would go on to make a number of predominantly console games until 2006 when they would switch to developing mobile apps such as AI Trader, Avatar, and California Geddon. I'm starting to notice a trend in game developers switching over to mobile apps within the last 20 years. Notable games that Black Ops Entertainment developed are the PS1 version of 007 The World Is Not Enough, Warpath Jurassic Park, Treasures of the Deep, Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines, Fugitive Hunter War on Terror, which is a notoriously bad game, known as America's 10 Most Wanted in PAL regions, and one Street Ball, Street Hoops, two NCAA March Madness games, three Knockout Kings titles, Black Dawn, known as Black Dawn Blast or Be Blasted in PAL regions, and my personal favorite of the bunch, the X-Files Resist or Serve, which I'm proud to own a copy of. Before moving on, I should quickly mention the Body Brothers. No, not spelled like that. Like this. Will Body was the director of this game, and either was, or still is, the VP of Software Development for Black Ops. His twin brother, John Body, is the president and CEO of Black Ops, and also has a few credits of interest beyond this. In 1984, he made The Lost Ark of the Covenant for the Apple II, which was a very Indiana Jones-inspired adventure game that looks really cool. At different points, he's been a producer slash executive producer for Activision, EA, and Ubisoft. He's credited for doing something or other on It Came From The Desert, but I scrolled through the credits on both the Amiga and the TurboGrafx CD versions and couldn't find his name listed, so I'm not sure about it. I was able to find that he was given special thanks in Demolition Man for the 3DO, whatever that entails. And I guess he was also given special thanks with at least one of the many versions of Cool Spot, but I checked them all and couldn't find his name listed. Overall, Tomorrow Never Dies did receive a lot of negative reviews. I'll be going over some of the complaints that both critics and the public had about the game, as those issues also frustrated me, but it should absolutely be mentioned that perhaps the most significant point of contention with this game is the unfortunate timing. It definitely has its flaws, but I think it's actually a fun game that was up against great odds before anyone even played it. It was the first Bond game to be released after the groundbreaking GoldenEye 64. You might say it was the Jacob Dylan of 007 and there was no way it was going to come anywhere near the quality of Bobby, let alone eclipse him. Another criticism to mention are the comparisons to Siphon Filter, which I totally get. Siphon Filter came out earlier the same year and both games seem to use that same frenetic style of third person run-and-gun shooter worked into government espionage narrative. Siphon Filter, however, did it way better. Between controls and compelling story, there's just a lot more there. Plus, if you're gonna make an awkward third-person shooter with weird mechanics, you better at least give the character a goofy run so we can laugh about it and remember it years after we played it at our neighborhood friend's house. If you want a little bit more background on the cultural relevance of 007 James Bond and the significance that the series has with me personally, you can check out my previous video on 007 Racing, which I'll leave a link for in the description. Tommy Tellerico Studios.
Story-wise, the game is directly modeled after the film of the same name, which had come out two years earlier, despite the project development starting even before that. Apparently Black Ops wanted to treat this like a semi-sequel to the movie, but MGM made them do some focus groups and a bunch of random people said that they would prefer a direct adaptation of the story in the film. In between levels, Not Judy Dench delivers bare-bone mission briefings. 007, satellite reconnaissance has located a military outpost on the Russian border and we get short, blurry clips from the movie. This really is the major extent of narrative effort, with the exception of a few sprinkled in-game cutscenes that have pretty funny voice acting. Mr. Bond, still trying to write a happy ending? Too bad you're missing the key part of the story. <laughs> I'm afraid you'll need this to disarm the missile. As with my last Bond video, I'm not gonna bother with the plot here, I'm sorry. It just really doesn't matter, especially when considering how lackluster it feels within the game. Good guy chase bad guy, bad guy blow up, pretty lady kiss good guy, pee pee poo poo, you get it, it doesn't matter. The point is to sit back and enjoy the simplicity behind the explosions, alright? None of the actual actors are doing voices here, and that can be both a good and bad thing. Some of the voice work is laughably bad, and if you like campy stuff like I do, this can be a legitimate source of entertainment. The the unfortunate side of this is that I feel that a lot of the James Bond charm and wit is kind of lost in the shuffle. The game just feels straightforward in plot, and we don't get many intended chuckles between the important bits. Well, occasionally there's a joke like this. Carver is hosting a large party tonight, and will be busy broadcasting the launch of his global satellite network. His wife, Paris, might have some knowledge of his dealings. Perhaps you can pump her for information? What? Ew. <laughs> what? Gross. Jesus. <laughs> Let's get the most significant negatives out of the way so I can just focus on the positives. First off, 007 Tomorrow Never Dies has horrible frame rate issues. Look, I want to establish one major thing with this channel. I am not a tech head. I care way less about frame rates and resolution than a lot of people out there do. My main concern is gameplay. Is it fun? The only time I'll really address something like frame rate is when it's hindering said fun. And in this case, it does indeed hinder the fun at certain times. Like, just look at this. I'm sorry if this is giving you a headache, but you have to see it to believe it. My god. The other major issue I have is with the circle button. This is used as your basic action button for opening doors, activating elevators, pressing buttons, etc. I'm honestly trying to figure out which thing to complain about here first, because one problem only exacerbates the other, trust me. For one, it's extremely finicky. You have to finagle the character all over the place and hope that the button works properly. Most of the time it doesn't. Now add to this that circle is also used to target enemies. Enemies that are constantly respawning. So you can start to maybe put together all the things in your brain and figure out how horrible of an idea this was. You'll be trying to get through a door, but Bondi Boy keeps spinning around to target enemies that keep appearing out of nowhere. It's awful. Additionally, the targeting doesn't even work properly. Games that utilize a targeting system like this usually either require that you hold the targeting button or simply press it once and then you stay targeted on the enemy. Sometimes you can toggle that option. Well, this game doesn't do either of those things. Circle will awkwardly slap you around to face an enemy, and when you give up doing the other thing you wanted to do and try shooting at the enemy, the targeting will suddenly go away as the stupid guy rolls around and depletes your health within seconds, which is another issue. I played the game on agent mode, aka easy, and I actually hit a few difficulty walls along the way. Enemies can suck your health down in seconds and you have to be really careful of that. This has a major impact on the way you play the game because you end up having to slowly inch forward in segments and shoot guys as soon as you see them. This is a jam James Bond video game. You should be encouraged to have fun. Instead, you'll find yourself tiptoeing around and trying to abuse the buggy mechanics to take out enemies before they spontaneously appear and abruptly kill you. And that really is the biggest issue. I've already said it multiple times in this video, but it bears repeating. The enemies just respawn behind you out of nowhere. It can really kill the fun at times. The bosses don't do much to help this issue either. Basically, the one strategy to defeat every boss is just make sure to have lots of health packs. The boss fight consists of you staring at a person and holding down the shoot button while you continuously reheal yourself. You'll do this until the floating percentage above their head says zero. That's it. Sometimes minions will spawn in, but you know, that's it. Another major issue is the slow movement when aiming with certain weapons. The rocket launcher and sniper rifle are pretty frustrating to use because of this, and you can't toggle the sensitivity anywhere in the options. To add to this, there's a mini boss fight where you have to shoot down a moving helicopter with the rocket launcher. You move so slow. What's the deal with the PS1 James Bond games and annoying helicopter battles that don't fit within the framework of the designated game mechanics? Beyond those issues, I have just a few minor gripes here. There's a lot of screen tearing in this game, and invisible walls are set in places where it feels like they shouldn't be. 
Come on, body bros. I just want to go up to the edge of this cliff and catch some Lodeller, my friends. Let me see what's past those cliffs. Let me see what's past those rocks. Let me see what's past those montañas. Enemy AI is pretty bad. They roll around too much and disregard getting shot. Sometimes hits don't register at different distances, which is especially weird when it happens in this sniping level. The skiing segments, which I'll talk about more in a minute, are kind of a missed opportunity because they don't give you any weapons. In a James Bond video game. Well, technically they do give you a weapon, it's your ski poles, which you flail around at the enemies on either side of you to do hardly any damage as they completely wreck you. This just makes me want to play SSX or Road Rash or something. Apparently, Will Body had 30 days to make the game engine for these skiing sections, which is impressive. It's just strange that they didn't do much to build upon this during those three years of production. There are occasions when certain required actions are not telegraphed in an obvious way, and that really just comes down to good game design. Like this segment, for example. You're supposed to shoot your way through this piece of glass and escape the building. It isn't clear whether it's a mirror or TV or window, but if you shoot it several times, nothing happens. I ended up circling the building multiple times until I gave up and watched a dang video, only to discover that had I kept mindlessly shooting the glass, it would have eventually broken. I think a good design decision here would have been to use sound and visuals to show that the glass is cracking and eventually going to break. Or there's this part where the text on screen just says that something is hidden when you press the janky action button on this painting, which is concealing an item that you need to progress the level. In order to open the secret compartment, you have to push this random file cabinet forward. Simply adding, there must be a secret lever somewhere, at the end of that text would have indicated that we indeed need to search for a secret lever somewhere. As it is, it doesn't really make sense to assume that you have to push some innocuous file cabinet in the room to open this. It's weird, and it could have been handled better. Again though, I consider this to be minor. Just to fill you in quickly on controls, R2 and L2 strafe, so yeah, it's one of those games. L1 crouches, which is useless, and it also lets you slowly walk, which is useful for aforementioned reasons. If you hit R2 or L2 while crouching, you can do that rolling stuff that the enemies just love to do around here. R1 is for aiming and X is to shoot. Triangle accesses your weapons and items menu and circle is the devil. There is analog support and I used it for the whole game. The controls were pretty clunky through my whole experience, so maybe it's different for someone playing with the D-pad. Oh, and on that topic, it's easy to get stuck on things like trees and walls in the game. There are a lot of narrow spaces that Bond will throw a fit about before going through. It was always annoying. Okay, I'm done with the bat now, I promise. At this point it probably sounds like I don't like the game, but that isn't true at all. I actually really enjoyed it. I mean for one thing, I beat this game, which you can't say about 007 Racing, and it can be done in just a few hours since there are only 10 levels. Some people might say that's a bad thing, but I actually appreciate games that don't waste too much of my time. Though I totally get why someone might complain after having spent $50 on a game and getting 2 hours of gameplay out of it. Adjusted for inflation, that actually ends up being somewhere over 80 bucks. When it isn't stumbling over itself, there actually is an enjoyable flow to the game. The fun to be offered here really takes me back to a very simple time in gaming that I kind of miss. You just zone out and gun things down as you round jagged corners and grin ear to ear at the silly human animations. I get a natural high from this stuff. The kind of feeling that allows me to just appreciate this suspended moment in this otherwise sad world we live in. The experience I'm having is, you know what? It's like watching a Bond film. It's flawed and silly and stupid and fun all at the same time. There's a story there that doesn't really matter, but it's just there if you want it to be. There are transient characters that take form and dissipate like ghosts summoned by your willingness to care and exercised by simple distraction. I'm looking one moment at the screen and feeling a slight tinge of nostalgia, and in the next moment I'm staring at the window. I'm staring past the window, and I'm on a thousand thought streams, forgetting myself and my problems, and I'll only be sad again when I come back. But right now I'm not back. Right now I'm running, and I'm shooting, and there's an explosion when I want there to be one, and occasionally there's even one more. And I'm exceeding all human expectations as the 007 Bond theme is playing in the room next door. It's muffled but comforting as I open the door and lessen the low pass. Hey, speaking of which, the music in this game is pretty great actually. Put together by Tommy Tallarico, who is known today for being the CEO of Intellivision and the creator of Video Games Live. The music here does a great job of balancing between uniquely creative and appropriately familiar. Tommy Tallarico has done a lot of game soundtracks over the years and is well known for his work. He did the Sega CD slash Mega CD version of The Terminator, two Cool Spot games, Aladdin, 
The Jungle Book, the Genesis slash Mega Drive version of Another World known as Out of This World in the US, as well as its sequel on the Sega CD Part of the Alien, Earthworm Jim 1 and 2, The Bard's Tale, both Maximo Ghosts of Glory, aka just Maximo, and Maximo vs. Army of Zin, Pac-Man World, MDK, and many, many more. I like some of the environments in this game, like this hallway and these bunkers with these shoddy wooden ceilings. There are some tiny little flourishes of detail that give the game a bit of charm, and that, my friends, is the absolute butter to my bread. Look at these oranges. Look at these potatoes and tomatoes. Look at these playing cards. Look at this computer mouse. Oh, I love it. <laughs> look at, uh, look at this mechanical door that is supposed to look like it's sliding up and down. They just stretch and shrink the asset to give it the effect of opening and closing. <laughs> it's t it totally doesn't work, but I love it. Look at this lighting effect, everyone. Somebody had to painstakingly make these lens flares. It's so easy for us to disregard an effect like this, but for an older PS1 game to have this is pretty cool. Hilariously, they couldn't really do this with every light, so I only noticed it happening twice. Look, it's on this light, but not on this one because that one effect took up a lot of space, I guess. <laughs> did I mention the voice acting already? I think I did, but here, I'll just play some for you. Can I help you, Mr. Bond? I'm looking for Paris Carver. Have you seen her? Yes, I believe she's waiting in your suite. And your presence is required there as well. <laughs> this business between you and Carver needs to end. Seems to me the only thing ending is your life. We're cooking quinoa. We're gonna start over on the counter and I'll talk you through it. Okay, the last one I made up. But the other is pretty funny, right? I mean, at least mildly so. Though they aren't done very well, it's nice that the game throws in two skiing segments and one driving segment. It's more often than not that these multi-genre attempts don't work very well, like in a way that says jack of all trades and master of none. Like a Cheesecake Factory menu if the Cheesecake Factory wasn't actually good. You know, Mary Jane Watson stealth segments that ruin the flow of the game type of thing. 007 TND is no exception, however, I will say that these segments do happen at the right times and are super short, so it all kind of works out. Problems aside, the ski sections let Bond do some of these super cool aerial tricks. <laughs> what are they? What are they? What is this? What is this trick? I don't understand what this trick is. And I seriously didn't know how to pull them off until I referred to the manual. Sometimes he doesn't land them, and I don't know how to avoid that. And the car segments are fine, you know? You drive and shoot the bad guys. It is what it is. Eh. The missiles kind of suck, but hey, we're being positive now. So yes, Gabe Logan does do it better, especially since he can actually jump and climb on things, but this is a fun game. The gadgets are here aplenty, and the goons are here even more aplenty. Apparently there was supposed to be several more levels and even a multiplayer, but those things got cut before the game was released. Which is unfortunate, since running around and shooting baddies in this game can be enjoyable. I actually recommend you pick up 007 Tomorrow Never Dies on PS1 and play it. You might accidentally ease into liking it. Be nice to people. Bye.